Today on Coding 101, it's Santa's Little Helper, Part 2. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com. Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. And by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7 which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code C101 at checkout to get 10% off. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit, and joining me today, our Code Warrior, Mr. Lou Maresca. Lou, so good to have you back on Coding 101. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, it, we we did skip last week because it was Thanksgiving. Uh, did you have a good Thanksgiving? Were you were you staying up in Redmond Town? No, I actually I was in Ohio this uh, for Thanksgiving. It was great, actually. Weather a little cold, little little snowy. Actually, I got to see some snow instead of some rain, but it was not too bad. A lot of programmers in Ohio, are there? <laughs> I think there's a programmer deficit in Ohio. <laughs> That's okay. We'll make up for it here on Coding 101. Now, Lou, last time we were on, we started up a program which which chat room called Santa's Little Helper. We were trying to figure out a, a clever name. It's perfect, and the whole idea was to create an application that would automatically check prices of items that you wanted to watch over the holiday season. Like, let's say, for example, that you wanted to get someone a big screen TV and you wanted to watch Newegg and Amazon or whatever it might be, you gave us the framework to, to do that. Correct, yep. Yeah. It's just a basic start of being able to call different APIs uh, based off of the URL you pasted in. So if you went to the site, you found the item that you wanted, you grabbed the URL, pasted it in there, and then hit enter, and boom, you got kind of the details behind the pricing. And then you can continue to run that over and over again. And then there'll be code later on to basically save all the different historical prices for that item. Right. Uh, of course, we made that code available. So if you went to the show notes, you could download an entire working package. But we're going to be evolving that program over the next few episodes so that at the end, you should be able to have a program that you can customize exactly to your liking and uh, get your own Santa's little helper. But Lou, before we do that, do you think maybe we could uh, talk a little bit about some of the ongoing things in the world of programming? Let's do it. All right. Uh, this one is this is interesting. Uh, now, we all know that computers are really good at brute force calculations. In fact, back in 1997, when Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov in chess, that's basically what it was. It was the ability to recall just hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of moves every microsecond so that it could look at what were the possible outcomes and then choose the one that was best for it. Now, it took a while for IBM to program Deep Blue to be able to perform even that feat, but now there are a group of researchers who are looking at a different sort of problem, not just brute force, but something that requires cataloging skills. Now, Lou, why, why is cataloging something difficult for computers? I mean, the first thing is it, there's got to be a dichotomy around the data that you have. And you, the computer doesn't necessarily know exactly what you're talking about unless it has the ability to sift through that data. And so, for instance, if I talked about ducks and I, then I talked about hockey, it doesn't understand that there's a ducks and a hockey team called ducks. And it doesn't understand I wasn't talking about an animal or a sport. So when you categorize the data, it kind of narrows or filters the search data down to a specific set, and it's easier for that then to iterate over that smaller set. Right, and that's, you know, that, again, that's something computers are exceptionally good at once they have the category. So if we give a computer 12 different categories and then we give it a huge data set, it will be able to sort that data set into those categories much faster than a human would ever be able to. But as you said, making that cognitive leap has always been a challenge for computer science. 
uh, you know, let, let's say, for example, I, uh, I, I wanted my uh, computer to look through data uh, pertaining to the space program. And I have one article that talks about rockets. And I have another article that talks about liquid oxygen. Well, my brain is going to necessarily put those together because I understand that liquid oxygen is necessary for the production of rockets. However, a computer, unless it had a predetermined template that said I should put those two together, would not understand that those are related articles. This has been the basic problem with building around fuzzy logic. In other words, trying to imitate how the human uh, brain works, not just making categories and making correlations, but also going across fields in order to, to build up a database in our minds. So that's something that humans have been better at than computers forever. Except maybe not now. There's an article here about <laughs> how a team at the University of Wisconsin has developed a machine that can actually at least match, but m many times out -duel humans in the extraction and cataloging of data in the large scale. It was a team of researchers at the U, uh, U, UW Madison, led by Christopher Ree, who was a professor at the university. He cr they created a computer that can extract data from scientific publications and place it in a database with tens of thousands of other studies. Oh, again, this has been difficult because computers just don't think like humans. They don't make those natural correlations but they've created a system that can do that. They specifically created for the paleon, paleo, paleo, paleobiology database. It's a, it's a huge system that the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and other international organizations dump their studies into. They've been able to create a software system that look through the studies, that make those correlations, and then offer them up for a database of paleobiology. Uh, Lou, uh, what, what would you have to do in order to make that step? I mean, of course, this is all cutting edge, but as a computer programmer, what are the things that you would look at doing in order to let a computer have that power of recognition? I mean, the first thing is it's very similar to how search engines work today. They go out and they web crawl all the websites. They look at links. They look at data on that links, and then they kind of index that data. So that would be the kind of the first thing I would need to do is to go out and all the data that they were actually researching into or needed as research, I would have to go and crawl it, index it, and then find a way to, like you said, break it down into categories and actual, you know, physical useful, useful data to be able to query again. So that would be the first thing I need to do. Yeah, that indexing is the first part to having the ability to create a database that can be used by big data. Oh, big data is all the rage. We've been talking about it for the last 18 months, maybe even two years. And it's the idea of pulling in multiple disparate data sources in order to make correlations. Well, that's good and all, but if you don't have the data in the database to pull from, then big data doesn't work. What the team is hoping is that now that they've created this correlative system that can look through studies and pull out those indexed pieces, that they can run it through a big data engine and uh, give the world a paleo database that anyone can make, well, big data correlations from. It's kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Now, Lou, when we come back, I want to go ahead and jump right back into Santa's little, little helper. We, we want to do a review so people remember where we were at the end of the last episode. But before we do that, could we go ahead and take a break? Because I'd like to talk about our first sponsor of Coding 101. That's Linda. Now, what is Linda? You might be asking if you've never seen an episode of, of Know How or Coding 101. Well, Linda is the online repository of information. Not just information, but information that you can use. That's very important, as we just heard about that U of W study. Now, Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. You can instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, graphic design, and more. Lynda.com works directly with industry experts and software companies to provide timely training, often the same day that new versions or releases hit the market, so that you'll always be up to speed. All courses are produced at the highest quality. Courses are broken into bite-sized pieces so that you can learn at your own pace and learn from start to finish or just find a quick answer. That's one of the things that I like about Lynda. Because they've got transcripts of all their lessons, you could look for a key phrase or a particular question or a particular answer rather than having to scan through an entire set of lessons. Look for the thing that you need. That's what Lynda is all about. Now, whether you're a beginner or advanced, lynda.com has courses for all experience levels. And you can learn on the go with their apps for iOS and Android. One low monthly price of $25 gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 video tutorials. Premium plan members can also download project files and practice along with the instructor. 
which is important. I mean, if you've got the same files that your instructor has, it means that you can make the same uh, mistakes and you can make the same corrections and you can make all of the same correlations that your instructor does through his lesson. And uh, well, it just helps you to learn. Now, whether you're completely new to coding or you want to learn a new programming language or just sharpen your development skills, lynda.com has you covered and it's what we recommend. Here on Coding 101, we can't teach you from start to finish. We show you highlights. We get you interested in certain languages. We bring on experts who will show something interesting that they've done. But if you want to fill in the gaps, and there's an awful lot of gaps, you need something like lynda.com. In other words, it's not just a place to go to learn new skills. It's a place to go when you've got a skill you want to develop and you need a place that understands the way you learn. Now, new programming courses include programming for non-programmers, which is perfect for us, iOS 8, WordPress, Developer Tips, Creativity Bootcamp, and Web Design Fundamentals. For any software you rely on, lynda.com can help you stay current with all software updates and learn the ins and outs to be more efficient and productive. And we've got a special offer for you to access all of the courses free for 10 days. Visit lynda.com slash c101 to try Lynda free for 10 days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C-1-0-1. And we thank Linda for their support of Coding 101. Let's get back to the action. Lou, in the last episode, we showed people how to access basic data through APIs. However, we also showed them, at least you showed them, how you could access the APIs of companies that don't necessarily want you to have access to their APIs. Can you tell us a little bit about what your thought process was through that? Yeah, so like a lot of the, like you said, a lot of retailers like Best Buy or Amazon, they give you the ability to kind of search through their through their data and and actually pull out, you know, based off of keywords or based off of a SKU. I think Best Buy uses SKUs to identify their items. But some some retailers, they, they're just not kind of in that, allowing users to, to basically build I'm, I'm sorry, allowed third parties to kind of build applications to pull data from these from their database. And maybe it's because they don't have the scale on their hardware to be able to handle that. Maybe they can handle a bunch of web users, but they can't handle a bunch of API calls. And so they don't have that ability. Maybe maybe it's just they didn't want to make it public. Um, so like, for instance, Newegg is one of them. They, they have what they call a private API where they, they have special partners that can kind of sign up and use their API to pull data about parts and you know items on in their site, but they don't have a public one. So one of the things you'd have to do is, and one of the things I did is kind of reverse their site in a way where I can use that private API to kind of pull the data that I need without having to what we call screen scrape from their website. Um, and so that's kind of what I did for one of them. But Best Buy and some of the other ones, they give you this API, and then they just they kind of throttle you based off of how many calls you make. But at, you know it's pretty easy to use their API. Right, right. And what we did was we broke down the app that we wanted to create into that fourfold category that we we introduced, I, it must have been 10 weeks ago. You know, the first part was to figure out what we want the functions of the app to be. In this case, we wanted the app to be able to look for certain items on certain websites, on certain services, maybe compare prices, but essentially just access information about an item from multiple sources. The second thing that we, we suggested doing is to gather resources. In other words, what do I have available for me? And what Lou did was he showed us that we have all these APIs, either public or hidden APIs that we can access so that we don't have to do screen scraping. And, and Lou did talk a little bit about screen scraping in the last episode. Uh, Lou, you want to refresh their, their memories on what screen scraping means? <laughs> sure. So it's just what we call our technical term for pulling data that's unstructured from a website. So if you go to a website today and you look at the underlining HTML of that website, there's a bunch of data that I can like click on the price of an item on the web page, and then there's a little tag underneath there that has the price element. And so what I could do is I could write some special code that goes in and looks through the HTML of every web page and then extracts that price out and then saves it off. And so it's, it's kind of a very fragile piece of code because anytime a, a site might change their website or might change some of their elements, their naming conventions, maybe their way they set their prices, then that code might break. So you have to basically go in and fix that code. But screen scraping is just an ability. If a, if a, if a site doesn't have an API to call, you can just go to the web page and pull the data out that way. Right. And uh, JJ to the 4884 in the chat room is saying, well, is that is that legal? It sounds like a funny question, but that's actually a, that's a very good question to ask because you've got cases like, for example, Ticketmaster sued 
to stop several screen scraping apps from taking their prices and putting into their application. Uh, what Ticket, uh, the Ticketmaster was saying was, look, that's proprietary information. We're showing it to the public, but it's copyright. You can't just take it. And what those other companies were saying was, look, if you put it on the internet and if it's just text, you can't copyright just text that randomly goes up on the web. Uh, they, they've gone back and forth, and actually, I don't even know wh where they left that case, but that is something to consider. If you are dealing with information from a company that really doesn't want to make the information public, you're, you may be running into some, some uh, legal, ethical, moral grave area. So <laughs> right. just, just know that. Be a little careful. I mean, honestly, that's kind of a slippery slope if you think about it, because that's really what search engines do, right? They right. go to every web page in the entire you know, internet web space and they pull data out of them so i mean if you were to go to google and search for Ticketmaster price i'm sure that they'll probably point you to Ticketmaster. so i think you know that that's a slippery result but either way yeah you should be very careful when you're not using public non-public type apis right uh, I, i'm not saying don't do it i'm just saying that if you do do it you're probably not going to find a lot of sympathy when it breaks because eventually they're just going to change one thing on the page and you'll have to rewrite your screen scraping app. That's yep, we exactly. see that we say that all the time. Now, the third part was to build a logic tree. In other words, once we know what we want the app to do, once we know what resources we have available for us to do it, to figure out what will be the components of our application. So, do we need to bring something in? Then, then we have to write a function to bring it in. Do we need something else to be able to compare values? Then we have to write a function to do that. Do we need to write another class that's going to be responsible for pushing that data back out to the user in some understandable format? Then we need to make sure that there's a logic branch for that. And of course, the last part is to make each part of the logic tree a reality. And that's pretty much where we are now. Last week, Lou, you gave us working code, actual code that people could download to get this up and running. We're going to do a little something different today. Tell me, in broad strokes, what do you want our audience to learn by the end of today's episode? Sure, I think, I think what we want to do is kind of go over calling one of these APIs and making sense out of the data we get back and then be able to use it inside your code. So I think we kind of said we built out the structure. We, we gave you the concepts last time. We said, okay, this is how we can do it. And this is how you can break it down. But let's actually show you how to do it. And then this way, you can kind of use that to apply it to maybe other, you know, retailers that we don't actually give you. So I think that that might be the best to kind of Kind of teach you how to fish and then let you go fish, so so to speak. <laughs> Give a man a fish and he'll shop for a day. Teach him how to use the APIs and he'll shop forever. <laughs> that's right. I don't. I don't know if that. No, that doesn't. That doesn't work. Oh, that's that's a fantastic plan. So uh, that's where we're going to be going right after this break. I want to do one more ad so that we can bring you home uninterrupted. But essentially. We're going to build on the foundation that we had from last week. And remember, you're all going to get every last line of code that Lou's going to be showing you. It will be available in the show notes. You'll be able to download it immediately. You'll be able to open it up, run it, play with the code. And Lou, uh, am, am I right in assuming that you want people to try this code with other web presences, right? Uh, I mean, who, who are you giving this code for? Yeah, I think anybody who wants to, I mean, right now we're going to give you a couple providers. I think Best Buy, we have a Best Buy one, we have a Walmart one. But, you know, feel free to kind of extend that and, and, and add it your own, you know, whatever. I mean, something you might want to track prices, I don't know, Macy's, um, whatever. So, I mean, yeah, go ahead and expand it and see if, you know, there's a lot of public APIs that we're not taking into account here. Uh, and, you know, expand it, see what you can do with it. Yeah. Actually, does, does Amazon have a public API? Well, they must, right? Because, oh, well, actually, no, they run their own app. Uh, have you tried Amazon? Yeah, Amazon has an API. You do have to sign up for to get an API key so they can track you what you're actually looking at. Um, but uh, they do have a what, they, what we call a private API too, which is what their app uses. Um, it's really all dependent on what you want to use and if you if you want to be able to uh, have them track your stats too. So I, I, I normally use the public one, but it doesn't matter which one to use. Fantastic. Uh, speaking of using public keys and using resources that are available to us, what if you want to make your resources available to others? Now, you could go the traditional route and you could rent a host and you could get your domain and make sure that you get the one that's exactly right for you. And, and you could do all your own programming, install PHP and MySQL, and you could make sure that you're using a framework like WordPress, but alter just a tiny bit so it better suits your, yeah, you could do all that. Or you could try Squarespace. Squarespace is a one-stop shop for everyone who wants a presence on the internet. Now, Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, 
And I got to tell you, it's awesome. It's got a completely redesigned interface and so many features that other providers will charge you for. Now, I've used Squarespace extensively over the last couple of years because I deal with a lot of organizations and in my day job that require non-technical people to publish content to the internet. I could have shown them how to use Drupal or WordPress, but I knew I'd be receiving service call after service call, so instead, I set them up on Squarespace. They don't have to worry about the programming. They don't have to worry about the maintenance. They don't have to worry about connectivity or, or keeping the server up. They just have to publish their photographs and their text, their stories, all of their wonderful content to the internet, and it looks beautiful. Oh, Squarespace is always improving their platform, and that's one of the reasons why I like them. Squarespace 7 makes getting started with your unique web presence even easier than before. It has a completely redesigned interface, now simpler to navigate and operate in one seamless experience. It's also easier to edit, allowing you to edit live on one screen. That means no more toggling between site manager and preview mode. You don't have to make a change and then jump over to the page to see how the change affected your content. As you code, as you change, it will change in that live preview window, which just makes it easier. Squarespace also gives you instant access to professional stock photography from Getty. They allow you to have direct purchases inside of the platform, which means you don't have to buy an image, import it, upload it to your server, code it into your software, and make sure it's all licensed. It's all one click. Just go ahead and jump in, say, I want this, and then drop it into your page. You also get instant branded email set up with Google Apps. Now you can brand your email for your small business so that it doesn't have a Gmail address, but it actually says www.padre.com, whatever it's going to be. It's important to have that professional look if you're going to have a professional website. Now, speaking of professional website, they understand at Squarespace that we're all not going to want the same looking web presence. So they've got templates that are specifically designed for specific professions. If you're working with musicians, artists, architects, and chefs, they've got one category that caters to site requirements for, for those industries. Another one for industry groups. Another one for, for people who are in small to medium businesses. Squarespace gets that you want to look in a feel that's not just beautiful, not just eye-catching, but also appropriate for the business that you're in. Oh, the developer platform is out of beta, which means that you can customize your site exactly as you wish. If you are a coder or a developer, you will have access to the same platform that Squarespace uses for its own sites. That means complete control. They also give you e-commerce for nonprofits, for wedding registries, for, for school fund drives. They give you easy-to-use support that's available 24-7, plus help self-help articles and videos to browse at your leisure. And you'd figure for all of this feature, you'd be charged a whole heck of a lot. Well. No. Squarespace starts at $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Now, it's not just that. Squarespace is mobile ready, so it doesn't look just good on a laptop or a desktop. If you've got a mobile phone, it's going to automatically adjust so that the experience is good for your user, no matter where he or she is looking at your content from. And they take care of all your hosting so you don't have to. Now, with all of these features, all of these improvements, I, I just, I really want you to try Squarespace. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code C101 to get 10% off and to show your support for Coding 101. And to begin using Squarespace 7, existing customers go to the Settings tab to activate all those juicy new features. We thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. Squarespace, start here, go anywhere. Now, Lou. Show me the money. Now, I've got my basic understanding of, of what it looks like when I uh, use a JSON API so I can get information back or when I screen scrape. But you want to show us specifically how to access Best Buy. That's right. So I think let's, really quick, we'll go over a couple things. We'll go over, um, like, if you show my screen really quick, we'll, we'll go over a couple things. One, we'll go over calling the API with a keyword. And this is like, for instance, if I wanted to search for, let's say, Xbox One. That's a good Christmas item. Um, and so let's say I wanted to search for Xbox One. I wanted to call the API with a keyword. And then I get this, what we call a JSON blob back. And this is a big piece of you know, text that basically sections off the, key, the, the data that comes back about the item. And then how can I convert that into code so that I can actually read and query out, like let's say, the price of an item, the SKU or whatever, and then they extract that price out. So that's kind of what I want to do. Uh, in the code today. Actually, so, that, it's interesting because when you talk about getting that JSON, uh, we, we showed them that in the last episode, what a JSON blob actually looks like. And it really is 
a blob. It's everything. It's just flooding back into your computer. And it, it's interesting that you you have that that step in there to convert it to strong types because we need to go from the blob to something we can actually use. And in fact, it's it's a lot like the banter item that we talked about at the top of the show where you can have all the information, but unless you know how to categorize it, you won't actually be able to use it. Exactly. So I think one of the things that Best Buy does well is they, they actually have a really simple API. I mean, actually from, from a lot of, I mean, I mean, I might not be the best fan of Best Buy sometimes, but like <laughs> they have a really good API. It's very simple to use. And uh, one of the things that I've been actually trying to do is strong type it in a way where I don't have to do too much work to get it done. So like, for instance, right now they have a REST API. So what I want to do is I want to show how you can build that query, that, that API call very easily without having to do much work. And then when they get the data back, I actually create strong types for it by using a utility that will convert the JSON to C-sharp code. And so it makes it like, it's not gonna take maybe two minutes here. So let, let's, let's first do one thing. So first I sent a code to you guys that give you kind of like the framework where we have a base provider called a price provider. And in there it has three separate methods that you can get it by using a URL or you can get it by using an ID. But what I want to do is I want to add to this and I want to say in Best Buy's case, I might want to query based off of a keyword and say, hey, give me the, you know, this item and then the price for that item. So that's a little different than what this was. So I'm going to actually add a method to the Best Buy one uh, where it's, where it's what we call the return by keyword. So I'm going to add a method here um, called return by keyword. Um, and so what this will allow me to do is then go and get, you know, by keyword. But the thing is, I need to be able to call the API. So I'm going to add in here what we call a search query. So I'm going to add a new class called uh, the Best Buy Search Query. Uh, and what this is going to do is I've added, I've actually given you a base class in here already uh, called, uh, if you want to look under utilities, called a URL encoding parser. And what this does is if we look at the Best Buy API, they give you the this special URL that you need to call. Um, and if you look in here, there's these, there's a question mark and then there's a bunch of data after that. And that's what we call a query string. Mm. And so when you call a REST API, you can put a bunch of query strings. You, of course, you, you add your API uh, key in here and then the name of the item and some other things. And so what we want to do is we want to go and create a query string for being able to search by keyword. So I've actually added a special utility class in here called the URL and code parser that makes it really easy. And I'll show you how easy it is. So what I'll need to do is I'll actually inherit from that. Um, and it'll, I'll inherit the URL um, uh, parser. And what this will allow me to do now is I can just build up a parse um, for this URL. So like really easily I'll pop in here and I'll just paste the class this way. I don't have to type too much. And you'll see here that I have a search query and it inherits from parser. And now I've added the parameters that I require. The first thing is the base URL. It's a special search list URL. And then there's the... Um, the ST parameter after that question mark, and that's the search text, and then the number of pages I want, number of rows, and then of course what I want to sort by, and I can do a sort by best selling or or most frequent, that kind of thing. Right. And so this is the very simple use of an API to basically be able to query by keyword. Yeah. So, so and now, what what this is doing is that that first line, if if you scroll back up, that first line is actually that's just a standard URL. You can hit that from from anywhere in the world. It will call up a very specific location on that server. It will call the function searchlist.jsp, and then everything below it is you're just you're adding items to that query, that query string that you showed us earlier when you were looking right. at the Best Buy API. You're just saying put this in the query, this in the query, this in the query, and build it up until I'm done, and then drop it at the end of that URL. That's right. And so it makes it really easy. So once I pop back over to this code, I can write some simple code here that will then allow me to kind of query that using that new query provider. So I think the first thing here is my code wants to return this strong type that I called price search result. If we look at what that is, again, it's just a, a framework class that I created that has like some information about the, the item that's kind of agnostic of the retailer. So like, for instance, the title of it, the price and its ID, that kind of thing. And so I want, I want to return that as, you know, so I'm going to, that's the first thing I need to do is return, oops, I want to return my product, even though it doesn't have any data in it. Right. Uh, and so then the code kind of goes in between here. Uh, and so then I want to build up my query. So the first thing I want to do is I, um, and the ni nice thing is I immediately have this search query thing and I imported, you know, my class that I created. And in there I want to set the keyword, which is what I pass in here. 
um, and then I want to you know sort by best match. And that's really all I have to do. I'm done. So now what I want to do is I want to create uh, the URL for it. And the way you do that is you call the two string method. And if we look in here, the two string method basically just grabs all of the query parameters that I put in there, like the ST and the, and the sort, and it just appends them to the end of the URL. And so the URL that I get is the one that's very similar to the one on the Best Buy site that I, that I showed you. Nice. And so now that's it. And now I need to be able to call the API and return the data. Now, look, this, um, this, is, this is for the Best Buy API, but most APIs are going to run very close to this. They may, they may change the queries that you can make, but they all work on a URL that you, you append a, 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 some sort of query to, yes? Exactly right, yeah. Uh, most of them are REST APIs. Some of them are what we call a post or a package, right. and that means that you have to put it in the body of the, of the, um, of the HTML request, I mean, HTTP request. And so that's a little bit more complicated. Um, Amazon does that sometimes. But most are REST API. Most are just the URL with a bunch of query parameters on the end of it that kind of ask for a specific type of data. Right. And if you want to know the difference between uh, the, the, the different ways of submitting information to a server, I believe we covered that in module two. Uh, we, we specifically talked about what are the pros and cons of doing it each way. Personally, I kind of like putting everything in the URL. It's nice and neat to me. But some people do like having the method where you have to have it in the body because you can do certain things with it. Exactly right. Yeah, you can be more secure. So I think really quick what we'll do is we'll let's test the API. So I'm going to go in uh, very quickly, add a new project. I'm just going to do a console app right now called test. Um, and then in here, I'm going to call the uh, Best Buy price provider. And it should ask me, do you want to add that class uh, provider? And it should ask me if I want to add that. Let's see. But mine, don't call me a liar. It is calling me a liar. So I'm going to add really <laughs> quick. Uh, the the pro, I go in here and add the solution that I just created, which is this little class down here. And then Nano says, oh, yeah, you have a Best Buy priority created. So I'll go and add that using statement. Boom, I'm there. And then all I need to do is to create a test is I'll, you know, I'll return the price. And that's from calling the keyword method that I added, which is this guy. And in here, I'll put Xbox One. Uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and give us some zoom so we can... Oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. That's my fault. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and... So there we basically... This is our first test. So if we go and run this... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I've switched the default project to this guy here. Now, now you're hard coding this, but if, if we were actually making this app for use, we would never want to hard code a specific product. That's right. Yeah, this is just for uh, a, 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 like a test for us to, to, uh, to first to check out if the code's working correctly right. or not. Yep. So I'm going to set my, uh, this project as the default one so that the, it will run. Okay, so now we're, this is just a console app here, but I'm going to move that out of the way. Let's, let's step through it. So the first thing that we're going to see is, you know, we'll build up our search query and then we're going to create an HTTP client that makes, allows us to make the call. And then we meet, here's where we make the call out there. Right. And so the key here is what will end up happening is that made the call. So if we kind of hover over this inside here, you'll see this massive blob of JSON. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to see in here, but it's, it's kind of a mess. So what we, what we can do is we can actually copy this. And I'm going to show you a really cool yeah. tool that I found online, and it's called um, JSON Utils. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and uh, so, for anyone who's watching at home, that's what came back. So after he submits that URL with that <laughs> query, that's all the, That's why we call it a blob. It literally looks like a blob of stuff, but there's there's information in there that we want. Right. If you look in here, you can kind of see some things I need. Like I need the SKU for that's the Best Buy unique identifier, so like I need to grab that out be able to pull the price but if you see in here it has like the hardware id and all that junk right. so we need to be um, so i'm going to copy this out and i'm going to use a special utility called the json util mm -hmm. and this util what it will do is you basically can paste a blob in here and you can convert it to j to it to a bunch of classes down here which is really cool so i'll just go ahead and submit that and now it's actually created a bunch of best oh, Buy classes. no way that is beautiful Yep. Where is so this? What I'll do Go ahead. Uh, oh, where is this? Where was this located? This is called JSON Utils. Okay, we got to give them the link for this. I mean, this, this seriously, yep. because uh, we should, again, tell the people at home, if you were to type in that query, if you were just to hand type that query, you would get back that blob on your screen. It would show up in your browser. Well, so what this will do, this will actually take that blob and, and turn it into useful categories. That's right. Otherwise, you'd have to program it by hand. This, that exactly. is gorgeous. 
it's pre it's brilliant. So I, that's I, I thought it was a fantastic tool. So I thought I want to show it out. So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add that class now. I'm going to add a special class, which I call um, Best Buy Search Results. And then in here, I'm going to paste the code that I got back from there. So I'm going to go over to the site and I'm going to grab all these classes that they created in there. I'm just going to copy and paste it in there and then add a reference there. And so now I'm done. So now if you can see in here is if we go up to the very top, the one that I really want to pay attention to is this item document class. What it will return is the SKU ID and some information that I need about the item. So if I close this, now I can actually add back in here my code that I put in here. And there's a special deserializer that says, hey, use the search results I just got back from that utility and you know convert it to the actual strongly type version of it. And then what I can do then is I can go and grab the first search result out and extract the SKU. Nice. So there we go. And then I already have a class that I gave you that will take the SKU, the ID, and convert it to the price or the actual product. So that's what this line will do right here. Right. So because boom, the, now we have the, the, the JSON deblobifier already put all the data into strong types. So when you have a SKU, if you type in the SKU, it should already have the product associated with it. Exactly right. So if we run this now, let's let's just run it and stop it right there. Um, and if we step through it. You notice we get this blob back again. There's this massive blob here. And then now the next line should convert it to a strong type. So now if I hover over it, now I have a search result. It's got 20 documents in it. And here's all the different 20 different return types. And the first one being the Xbox Unity console, Assassin's Creed. And sure enough there, if I scroll down, the one of the properties is called SKU ID. And that's really what I want. Boom, there's the property SKU ID. There's a SKU. Nice. So, fantastically easy to do when you when you convert it to strong types. Yeah, it's, it's funny because when you do it this way, it looks ridiculously easy. I mean, yeah. you, this is not a whole lot of code. This is essentially using so, what someone else has already done, a couple of lines to, to pull the data in, someone else's utility to turn the blob back into usable information, and then it's just comparison. You're just, you're just doing comparisons. That's right. And so there is, I mean, Best Buy does have fantastic documentation on the stuff that comes back. So like, for instance, understanding the document and that there's many documents and then inside that document, the properties of that document. Right. So they do explain that on their API site. So check that out. But right. it's fairly self-explanatory. Once you strongly type it and you look through the code, you start looking through what you get back, you kind of understand, okay, well, I got a bunch of documents. There's 20 research results. As I said, that I wanted a, the minimum amount of a list items I wanted to come back was 20. So obviously there's going to be 20 search results. And then, you know, I want to pick the one uh, out that I actually need to use to get the SKU ID. And that would be the first document. Right. So if you look back at the code here, um, I'm going to pull the SKU ID and then I'm going to pass it back in to my get price by SKU. And then the next thing that happens is now I got my, my product and there's my price. Nice. Um, and so <laughs> pretty easy, pretty easy to do. And so, that's really just using some of the utilities that you have out there and, of course, the APIs that Best Buy provides. Right. So pretty, pretty simple stuff. Now, Lou, I, I, I got to ask because this is, this is great. This is very, very cool, but it's one manufacturer. It's one retailer. The challenge is when you start to say, okay, I want this, the Santa's little helper to actually compare prices. And as we know, most manufacturers aren't going to use the same SKUs. They're not going to use the same identifying information, maybe not even the same title of the, of the product. So you do still, if you're, if you're going to do multiple vendors, it's not just as easy as downloading all the JSON blobs from the different manufacturers and then comparing SKUs because those might not be the same, right? What, what do you have to do to match those up? So one of the commonalities between sites, especially Amazon, so Amazon uses what they call ASI and numbers. Best Buy uses SKU IDs. Uh, Newegg uses their egg IDs or whatever they use. Um, so they all have different unique identifiers for the retail items in their stock. But what they do use that's common is what they call model numbers or model IDs. And so, for instance, if I'm looking for like, you know, a specific model of TV, there's a special model ID that usually like Samsung will give like the SN3200 or something like that. And so the key here is if you're going to be kind of linking the data between all the different sites, you have to use something common. And so that's really something very unique and very common amongst all the sites. If I search by a model number in the keyword here, I'm going to get back that item and that's going to be the data that I need to use. And so that's kind of the key is, is using the specific unique identifiers across them. 
Now, that's if you look inside the base class I provided, it's called Price Provider Base Class uh, Retail Product. You'll see here that I have the ID and the Retail Unique ID. And so the Retail Unique ID is um, explicit to that, to that, like for instance, Walmart or the AISN from, from Amazon or the you know specific product IDs from you know Sam's Club or whatever. But then the ID itself would probably be the model number uh, to basically be the same across all products. So that's really need to do is you need to find a unique identifier that will allow you to go search amongst all the other retail sites. Right, and and actually, this is this is one of the reasons uh, I, I actually asked a programmer about this. This is one of the reasons why if you go to different retail stores, sometimes they have the exact same product, but like the last two letters or numbers have changed to denote that it's a product that's only available at that retail store. And a lot of times, it's to prevent people from scraping the prices because if they if they're just looking at the the, the bits of data in the JSON blob, they're not going to find anything that correlates it with the product from another company or another retailer, another site. That's that's something that as you as you make Santa's little helper more advanced, you can actually hard code those 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 differences. Because again, retailers have no obligation to make sure that you can directly compare just from the <laughs> JSON blob. That's, right. that's it, one of the it, things. Sometimes you want I mean if you're gonna building a, an application with a UI, so that's what, what the base the, the the ultimate goal here is. So what you could potentially do is you could potentially present it to the user. So like you can go and search like let's say Best Buy. I think that there's a there's a site out there that does this for prices for airplanes too, where you go and it'll search all the different websites for planes and it'll say, okay, you know, here's um, you know Priceline and here's this one over here and whatever, and they kind of give you side by side comparisons. So in the UI, you could potentially say, okay, here's Walmart's results, here's Best Buy's results, here's whatever choose the right item and then you'll go in and say, okay, yeah, this is the same item here and, you know, check box it or something. And then that's the one that will actually save off. So you kind of give it the more power to the user rather than making the application kind of do all the work is you kind of let the user decide on which item is the, the same, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And it's funny that we, we're doing this because this is actually what a search on Google or Bing will do. If you're looking for a product, it will tell you, oh, you could find it here, 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 and here. They're using a similar function to go through these different retailers, scrape the data off so that they can make it searchable on their own search engine. So, hey, you know, you're just doing one that's targeted for you. Lou Maresca, I want to thank you so very much for being part of this episode of Coding 101. It is always such a joy to have you on. And I, I got I love that JSON parser. I'm, I'm going to play with it right after the episode. Could you please tell the folks what we're going to be doing next week? You bet. So I think the first thing is we're going to put wrap a UI around it, like we were, we were promised in the beginning, as well as we want to be able to store that, you know, that data around all the different prices we get over a long period of time. So let's say you run it once a day for an entire week. You want to actually store that those prices, be able to query them and then be able to present that in a UI. We can kind of see the trends. So that's where we kind of slap a UI around it and maybe even a database to store that data. And that'll kind of uh, exit us out to an application you can actually use. Oh, I can't wait. This is going to be so much fun. Uh, I, it, it's nice to have an application that people are actually going to be able to use. I mean, even, even if you don't want to learn how to program this, the application that you're going to be able to get from us actually will be useful. Lou Maresca, could you, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Uh, we all know that you're a, a, a senior product developer, a, a software engineer from Microsoft, working on some wonderful CRM products, but where else can they find the work that you do? You bet. Anything posted on uh, Twitter at Lou MM, uh, and of course, the uh, about me Lou MM, check that out. Uh, I've been posting some new stuff that I'm going to be working on outside of work here, uh, and that should show up there as well. And then, of course, all the work I do here at Microsoft is at crm.dynamics.com. Lou Maresca, our code warrior, sir, thank you so very much. Uh, we offer a prayer of thanksgiving for your code warrior skills. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care, guys. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for this episode of Coding 101. Don't forget that you can always go to our show page. Just go ahead and jump over to twit.tv slash code. If you go there, you'll be able to find all of the episodes of Coding 101. So, for example, if you're watching this and you're a little puzzled by what, you're, what we're doing, we're actually discussing topics that have been discussed in previous modules of Coding 101. Jump back to Episode 1 or Episode 23. Look at what we did with Perl if you want to see what we did with regular expressions. Because we're going to take these features and use them over and over and over again. It's, it's uh, one of the things that we like doing here at TWIT TV. It's teaching you how to learn it. Now, also, don't forget that you can find us 
on YouTube. Just jump over to youtube.com slash twitcoding101 if that's the method of watching our content that you, 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 you fancy. We want to get you our content in any way, shape, or form that works for you. So again, if you go to our, our show page, you can also find a download link if you want to get it automatically subscribed on your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac, your PC, whatever way you want it, we're going to get it to you. Uh, don't forget that we've also got a Google Plus group, a very active Google Plus group. If you jump into plus.google.com slash twitcoding101, you'll find out what's going on with our community. This is a great place to ask questions because there's a lot of programming masters who can help you if you're having trouble with some basic concepts or if you've got a project that you want to take to the next level. Don't forget that you can also find me at twitter.com slash padresj. That's at padresj. If you subscribe, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll find out what I'm doing on every, uh, every episode of Coding 101, as well as all the other shows that I do here on the Twit TV network. It's, uh, it's a way to find out what I'm going to be flying the next time I put a quadcopter in the air, or what we're covering on This Week in Enterprise Tech on Mondays, or what we're going to be doing on Know How on Thursdays, Padres Corner, 7.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. Come watch us, come follow be part of the Twit Army. Don't forget that we do this show live every Thursday at 1.30 p.m. If you are available, drop by at live.twit.tv. You can watch the pre-show, the post-show, and all the bloopers that we take out of the final mix. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv so you can talk to us. I'll actually pull questions right out of the chat room for our live episodes because Twit's not just a show, it's an experiment in social something or other. I'll make something up for that later on. Uh, thank you for everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do it, and also to my super TD, Mr. Brian Burnett, Cranky Hippo himself. Uh, Cranky Hippo, where can they find you on the TwitTV network? Me? You. They can find me earlier on Thursdays with you on, uh, doing Know How. Uh, also, you should tune in and watch All About Android on Tuesdays. I TD that, and sometimes I mix it up. And you can also follow me on uh, Twitter at Cranky underscore Hippo. I think uh, <laughs> most recently I posted uh, Corgi Butt for uh. at Corgi Butt SJ. Thank you. That's just... Um... I feel I feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. This has been Coding 101. End of line.